keep on speaking for a while about uh, the photo voice that we'll be presenting together. And we will be speaking through the participatory visual action research method photo voice about the accounts of fishes, crab catchers, the agriculturists, and most importantly, the women of this riverine landscape. This landscape with alarming level of land subsistence, flooding, erratic monsoons, and increasing instances of cyclones. As they turn the lens on the lived experiences of uncertainty, climate change, and imagination for the future, we'll know how the visual methods were able to capture the tacit and embodied experiences of uncertainty and climate change. The stories will dwell on contestations in this flooded landscape, its culture, its place, its identity, due to the threats to traditional livelihood practices, its effect on the population and changing access to their traditional cultivable lands. After the photo voice presentation, uh, next up is our colleagues, Mahamuda Nupashana, who will speak about the digital photo diary, sorry, digital photo diary, which has been immersed among the islanders to facilitate emergence of new issues through a particularly grim period of COVID and Amphan and the misery of these times, leading to collective analysis, problematizing, and in the long run, a change within the community who are coming to terms with the practical issues of climate change and dual uncertainties to a sense of empowered awakening. Through this visual method, we have been able to honor these stories, which mirrors popular knowledge, which has always been disqualified and subjugated by the elite control over knowledge, being used as a way of maintaining a dominant status quo against pressures for social transformations. Through this storytelling and visual methods, we'll reflect on the struggles over the purpose or the production and use of knowledge. The panel will end with a colleague Anandita, who will present to you the stories expressed through the paintings by the children of Indian Sundarbans, which have been severely affected by the tropical cyclone storm Amphan and then Yash amidst COVID-19 situation and has led to multiple uncertainties. The children through their paintings and accompanying narratives to speak about their uncertainties, their fears, their traumas, and how they reimagine the future. The panelists who have been working with the marginalized communities for quite a number of years will speak about the experiences of conducting community-based participatory visual action research. So through the use of visuals and narratives in this session, the aim of our inquiry is not only to aim or predict, but to be able to understand, reimagine, and transform reality. So I, if uh, Sumaya is there, then we can continue with the photo voice or else I may want to hand it with to Anindita, if she's ready or to Pashana. I can. Anindita, are you starting? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think you should. Uh, uh, yeah. Hello, everyone. I am Anindita Shaha, working as a research associate at uh, CWH uh, Sussex University. I am also the part of uh, Tapestries Van Brook School project. Now I am going to share my slides. Today I am going to uh, share the experience of Sundarban's uh, youth. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes, 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 we can. Okay. Today, the topic of my deliberation is uh, living in an uncertain world, voices of the youths of the Sundarbans. 
Environmental literacy and co-production of knowledge is essential to empower the youth, particularly in a climatic hotspot like the Sundarbans. This is the basis of our innovative mangrove school project. We find the voice of the community reflected in the voices of youths aged 14 to 18 years. And these were our target group. Inspired by an interdisciplinary team of educationists, historians, anthropologists, and visual artists, we have selected 40 students randomly from one vernacular co-education school situated in the Delta region of the Sundarbans, keeping in mind gender equality. Our project objectives are to capture the reflections of youth regarding the anxieties and, and experiences pertaining to uncertainty and climate change, to understand youth's voices with regard to uncertainty and climate change, and to co-produce knowledge with expert opinions with creative results. The bottom-up methodologies that we have adopted to document the untold stories of youths include the collection of oral narratives, painting narratives, and written narratives. These are a few re reflections of the students. It is painted by a 10th grade girl. And the topic of this uh, image is desperate attempt for survival. The painting delineates the recurrent floods, cyclones occurring here, and the constant fear attached to it. The people here are desperate to survive and seek refuge in times of water logging by building rafts from banana trees that help carry people and domestic animals. It is painted by a, a 10th, a 12th grade tribal boy, and the topic is dying hope of the youth. The image shows how her youth have to study to secure jobs, but the advent of COVID has been a dark cloud looming over their heads. The image of the fairy and human skulls signify the gradual dying hope. It is painted by a 10th grade student who witnessed the brutal and deadly onslaught of Amphan. The title of this image is Witnessing Death Firsthand. He narrates that numerous trees were uprooted when the cyclone hit the Ganges Delta. He witnessed a tree falling on a vehicle, killing two people on the spot during Amphan. He mentioned that this traumatic experience will be forever etched in his memory. 10th grade student share his experience through this visual narrative. And the title of this image is Cyclone Amphan Cripples Our Sundarban. According to his narrative, Cyclone Amphan proved to be fatal for the people in Sundarbans under COVID. His own mud house was swept away because of the devastating cyclone. The old lady seen in the painting is his grandmother. She is wearing a mask that signifies dual uncertainty. Amphan and COVID. The painting invite audiences to respond in two overall ways to the images or text that demand them to situate themselves in relation to the art and the artist and what is being conveyed. To co-create transformation, we should ask following questions to ourselves. I am highlighting some important questions. Uh, what is this to me? What does it mean to me? What am I to this? Where am I in this story? What does this mean, this demand on me as human being, customer, con sorry, consumer, professional, citizen, or academic? Our future plans Our future plans are to bring the captured voices of youth into the public domain by organizing a virtual exhibition for the world and a physical one in Kolkata. And to draw the attention of our policymakers to the daily struggles, which may help them in planning an initiative to act according to the children's needs and future goals. 
like to stop here. Thank you. Thank you, Anandita. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful presentation. So I see uh, uh, Sumaya and uh, Mahmuda is in the LLA hub. So will Sumaya be going with the Proto Voice presentation or will they need some more time? Yeah. Hello, am I audible? Yes. Okay. So now I would like to request my colleague Sumaya uh, to start her presentation. He, she actually going to talk about uh, photo voice. Yeah. Hello everyone. Uh, I hope you can all see the screen. Yes. Uh, yes we can. Okay. Uh, can we go to the uh, slide mode, please? Okay. Uh, hello everyone. Uh, welcome to our session at the LLA Hub. Uh, I'm Sumaya Bintanwar, a research officer working at the International Center for Climate Change and Development. And today I will be uh, talking about uh, our project and a little bit of our work on conducting a photo voice. I will talk about exploring the tales of uncertainty uh, and resilience through photo voice. Uh, it, this presentation draws from the tapestry project from the theme of transformation and co-production. Next slide, please. Uh, in this presentation, we will uh, talk about the lived experience of the people of the Shundarbans living at the confluence of the active Delta of Bay of Bengal, uh, which is the single largest mangrove patch of the world spread across 10,300 square kilometers of which 60% is in Bangladesh and the rest of the part is in Shundarban. Next slide, please. We will- Slides are not moving. The slides are not moving for us. Uh, are the slides not moving uh, in the online mode? We will uh, talk about lived experiences of uncertainty uh, living through climatic natural disasters, climatic hazards like sea level rise, increasing surface temperature, high erosion rate in the active delta, increasing climatic events like cyclones and flood. We will talk about the uncertainty of COVID-19 and these climatic hazards that the people of these active deltas in Chundarbon are going through and living every day of their lives. Next slide, please. In addition to the uh, above mentioned ecological uh, uncertainty that I have talked about, there is also a series of cyclonic events that the people are facing almost every year and they're having trouble coping up with it. Uh, These cyclonic events are causing damage to the embankments, um, uh, to the mud, mud embankments, I would say, allowing water to enter the fields and uh, flood the uh, cultivable grounds and making the wa water and making the land saline. Next slide, please. In this project, uh, the photo voice component has been conducted among the women. I'm sorry, there, have, there seems to be a temporary glitch.
Hello? Uh, but are, are the slides being visible online? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, in this project, uh, we, will, we will tell the stories of around 7.2 million people living around the active deltas. In fact, uh, the population of the people, the amount of population living in these active delta is even more than the entire population of Norway, you know. Uh, they will, uh, we have conducted this uh, in a manner that the women living there, they have been asked about uh, to share their experiences of their daily lives, about their problems uh, and the solutions they are uh, coming up with themselves to solve these problems. And just they have shared uh, their daily experiences of living in these active deltas through these photo stories. Next slide, please. Uh, for these women, life has kind of changed after Isla, uh, when the river uh, water, uh, when the salt water entered into the lands and uh, made the water saline, their uh, means of cultivations uh, have been demeaned, their livelihood have been harshly affected. Um, most of the people, uh, the male members of their family, as uh, they opted to migrate to nearby cities for work and the women, they were left behind with multiple burdens of work. Next slide, please. Uh, we use women as co-researchers. Uh, the women group that uh, we targeted, we wanted to make sure that we include all the components, all the social components of women uh, living in those areas, for example, we have included crab and fish collectors, uh, women who are working in the care, as they call it in local language. We have collected uh, photos of uh, uh, experiences of women living on the embankment. Uh, we have targeted the ethnic minorities like the Munda community, landless farmers, care owners, and also people, women who are going inside the Shundarbans uh, to get, you know, uh, seasonal resources. Next slide. For most of the women, uh, it was a very exciting experience because a lot of them uh, had been given uh, mobile phones with cameras and uh, very simple digital cameras. And it has been kind of the first time for many of them uh, who had, you know, held uh, such a high tech device in their hand. Uh, we taught them how to use it. Uh, we asked them to capture their uh, daily experiences living in these areas. And it was a very exciting thing for them. They've learned through the process and they have lo uh, loved being a part of the process. Uh, in the next slide, I'll show you some examples of the uh, images that they have captured. Next slide. When the male member of their family uh, went to other cities for work because the livelihood opportunities after Isla had been uh, lessened in the area. They couldn't cultivate the lands. Uh, the gears that they used to work on were over flooded. When the male people migrated uh, due to the you know, social barriers, the women were left behind. We asked them uh, to share their life experiences and they came up with these stories by themselves. We just facilitated the sessions they took the pictures by themselves, the pictures that tell the stories of their everyday lives. In the first picture, you can see a group of women collecting water. In uh, coastal areas of Bangladesh, area uh, beside the sea, the water is a major problem. 
uh, fresh water is a major problem. They don't get water to drink. They need to walk. They need to walk miles of miles of um, muddy roads to collect water. They gave us this picture and wanted us to have a look that they need to collect heavy pots uh, with themselves and walk for miles to collect water. And this is a part of their everyday lives. And it has become a regular thing for them. But when we see it from outside, water for us is just a next to normal thing. But for them, collecting water uh, means to have sufficient water as a storage for every day is a factor of, you know, great big deal. So they gave us this picture to have an insight of their life. In the next picture, upper middle picture, uh, go back to the previous slide, please. Yeah, in the upper next picture, uh, you can see a woman. She works as a day laborer. Uh, she gave us this picture and she uh, wanted to tell her story indicating that as a woman, she has to conduct various activities. Uh, she works as a day laborer besides taking care of her home and this is an extra burden for her, she feels. In the next picture, you can see a woman uh, who is putting mud plaster uh, in her mud house. This is a thing she needs to do in almost every two to three weeks. And it's a very tedious job, uh, physically tedious job, I would say. She needs to do it because due to the saline soil, uh, the mud plaster of her house falls off and she needs to prepare it. Uh, she needs to repair it after one to three weeks uh, to make sure that her house remains intact. This is an kind of additional thing uh, she needs to do for her daily activity. In the next picture uh, down, this is a picture of a woman farmer uh, who works on paddy field in her area. Uh, she only depends on um, like uh, the paddy that, ha that is uh, in fact cultivated only in the rainy season because in the other seasons due to salinity, the paddy doesn't grow. So she really depends on the rainwater for her har harvest of the year and for her food storage for the year. This is the story she wanted to tell us through this picture. In the last picture, you can see two small children. The woman who took the picture, she wanted to tell us that she sometimes needs to go work for different works. She needs to go outside, but she needs to leave behind her young kids. She remains concerned about the well being of her kids. As she is a mother, she cannot live behind the responsibility of her kids, but she also has to take the burden of the various different other works uh, because her, her husband is not present at home. This is the story she wanted to tell. So she took the picture of her uh, young kids and wanted to tell her story through this picture. So this is an oversight of the triple burden of work for women living in those vulnerable areas. Next slide, please. From our tapestry project, we wanted to look into the locally led adaptation that these women community are practicing among themselves. We have already given an insight about the different uh, burden that they have within their lives, but what they are doing to cope up with it, you know, it's not all sad news everywhere. Uh, they wanted to tell us that uh, in many cases, we cannot go outside, uh, we cannot migrate like other men in our family for work. But what we are doing is we are turning our home ground into our own earning means. They are, where, wherever possible, they are trying to cultivate small homestead vegetables around their houses. They are uh, rearing domestic animals uh, by this domestic animals, they are being able to, you know, uh, sell uh, some uh, milk outside. They're uh, with the homestead gardening, 
they are saving some for their own consumption and they are selling the leftover uh, outside to nearby areas. And by this, they are kind of earning some means of monetary value and they feel that they're uh, turning their own houses, the area of their own houses into their own turning means. And it's very inspiring to see that they give so much efforts uh, to such adaptation measures. Next slide, please. In this picture, the woman, they wanted to show us that they're living with disasters, they're living with cyclones every day, you know, but they are coming up with their own means, their own survival techniques to battle these horrible winds and storms. This, by this picture, the woman they wanted to show was the local technique that they used to survive. In the first picture, you can see uh, the roof, the teen roof of their house being tied to the ground. It, it is done so that uh, the wind don't blow off the teen shades from their houses. And this is a technique they have learned by themselves, you know, living with such winds for years and years, and they have learned by themselves. Maybe uh, like in the villages of Bangladesh, I have, I have visited personally. I haven't seen this being done in other parts of the country because this is like a kind of area specific techniques that they have developed among themselves. So this is a tie that they use. You will find all the houses in the uh, coastal area where the, the roofs are tied strongly uh, to the ground to save them from, from being blown away. In the next picture, uh, you can see, uh, if you notice it, uh, there is a polythene covering uh, in the lower part of the house. This is being done so that the mud foundation that, give, that they give to their houses, uh, it is, the mud is uh, not washed away with the rainwater. And also so that the mud is not easily, you know, uh, thrown off and uh, for the saline soil. And these techniques they have learned by, them, by themselves. Uh, living with such conditions for years. And it's very interesting to see uh, that uh, they have shared such photos with us of their everyday lives. Next picture, please. In this picture also, uh, this woman, this sister, she gave us this picture and uh, she wanted to show that almost all the houses they have kind of a polythene rolled over around the perimeter of the house whenever there is water, rain, or very heavy winds. They just roll the polythene down so that they can be saved from the burst of the wind or the rainwater. Also, in this particular picture with the sister, you can see the plinth of the house is almost as her own height. And the houses, they are made very well high above the ground so that uh, during storm surges, uh, they have kind of a minimal protection uh, of not being uh, flooded and not being going underwater. And when you visit the coastal areas, you will see most of the houses are, being, uh, are in fact built very high above the plinth. And this is a local adaptation measure they have practiced for years among themselves. And the sister, she was very kind enough to share this aspect of her life with us through this photo voice picture. Next slide, please. In this picture, uh, the, uh, it, it's a very interesting picture as you can see. Uh, the road, it's a very narrow brick soling road. And the woman, she has to walk with her aluminum pot in local language, which we call kolshi. Uh, she has to walk with that to collect water from a long distance. And in inclement weather, when uh, roads are flooded with water after maybe rainfall or cyclones, uh, when the roads are flooded uh, with water, 
she has no escape, you know, she still has to go to collect her water for drinking. And there is no way around. Even in such condition, she has to go. So this aspect she wanted to share with us. Uh, when we were talking with the women community, uh, we asked them that, how are you feeling uh, participating in this uh, photo voice exercise with us? She felt that she's kind of doing a man's job. Now, why a man's job? Because in such communities, uh, you will find very less smartphones. And in the cases where there are smartphones, generally men are the owner. So they don't get to use such phones, you know, very often. So she just such a small thing, like giving her a smartphone in hand, it made her feel like she's doing a man's job. It's a very interesting insight. Uh, she also feels that she is doing something for her own self and for her children because they don't always get to express uh, their problems in loud voices, you know. Uh, they're very humble. Uh, generally, when asked to uh, discuss their problems, you will find uh, very less examples when they're, they are being very vocal. and. This photo voice exercise, uh, they found that it's very interesting because, you know, uh, just by showing a picture, they are giving us an insight of their problem because they feel that they are not always very comfortable uh, giving loud voices about their problems and their solutions and their lives and so on. So such pictures, it gives a very strong insight into, the, into their lives. So they feel very excited about it. Uh, they also want to say that uh, for migration, when people, when their husbands move away, they are not always present to, you know, uh, face the natural hazards. So they have to face it kind of alone. So they feel it's very important that, uh, and it's uh, very enlightening that they are sharing their voices and their problems and their measures with a wider community through these pictures. Next slide, please. Now, the problem is we have talked about such issues of uh, people living in coastal saline areas for ages. We have talked about the local adaptation measures that they are conducting among themselves also for ages. They are practicing various solutions. Uh, they are coming up with new innovative ideas. Sometimes it's succeeding, sometimes they're failing. When it is failing, they're coming up with a new idea and they're doing it all by themselves. Now, the question remains, you know, uh, these adaptation measures, how much sustainable are they? Because uh, when we talk to the community, um, for example, after 2009 cyclone Isla, it took them years to come back to a standing position of life again. After the COVID uh, lockdown, they had a hard time uh, bringing their livelihood measures under control again. And during the COVID, what happened? Cyclone Amphan hit again. And they had to start from the scratch because again, their cultivable lands were washed away. So they stand up again and then something like a cyclone happens once again and brings all their efforts to ground zero. So these adaptation measures, how much sustainable are they? Uh, this question actually remains to all of us and to uh, high level negotiations like the one we are attending now. Uh, with this photo voice uh, journey, we have a plan of country level dissemination and roundtable going ahead because this is just a piloting stage of our work. And everyone present in this hub, we would uh, like all of you to be a uh, part of our journey and to be involved with us going ahead uh, in these works. And uh, we will be sure to keep all of your contacts and make you, uh, you know, uh, a part of this journey while going ahead. Next slide, please. So this is it. 
maybe I took a bit more time than I was allotted, but uh, I wanted to share all the pictures that the sisters have shared with us and their stories through their eyes. Thank you everyone for all your patient hearing. Uh, back to you, Mahmouda. Thank you so much, Sumaya. Um, so the presentation that actually uh, she shared uh, was based on our photo voice activities. So now I would like to request my colleague uh, Upashana Ghosh to uh, talk a little bit about digital diary. So we actually, we also uh, like conduct a digital diary to facilitate co-production and to understand the agency of migrants in both Indian and Bangladesh Sundarban part. So Upashana, are you here? Yes, I'm here. Okay, please go ahead. So, uh, Mamuda, can you please navigate the slides or? Maybe yeah, yeah, I will, no worries. Okay, okay. So, hi, everyone. Um, already, my uh, colleagues have uh, introduced Sundarbans to you. And uh, just let me, just uh, to brush up you, that Sundarban is a climatically vulnerable, socio politically marginalized delta which caught between two political boundaries between India and Sundarbans, uh, India and Bangladesh. And, uh, uh, you know, this, this population is improvised. This population is uh, struggling uh, in day-to-day -day life with, uh, uh, with uh, avail their resources to continue the life, continue the uh, households. Uh, there are issues with uh, human nature conflict. This is, there are issues with uh, uh, trafficking um, and and many many other social and political issues. So in that context, gathering the data uh, or say for instance, better to say the perspectives of the communities is was very difficult. Uh, it was a challenge for all time. All the researchers who have uh, who, who worked in Sundarbans, they will all agree with us. And at the same time, uh, <clears throat> it is very uh, hazardous during the monsoons or the cyclone seasons because due to the climate change impacts, uh, the Sundarbans in both India and Bangladesh uh, are now very prone to natural disasters like cyclone and floods. So almost each year, uh, uh, the, this delta is gaining the cyclones like Amphan, Yash, or uh, many others. I mean, uh, the, there are so many cyclones are there. So uh, within these situations, the pandemic COVID-19 happened and the entire research activities for us was became a standstill. But uh, as researcher or as uh, um, committed to the people, to the communities of uh, Sundarbans, uh, we wanted to capture their daily, their narratives, their, their struggle of their life during the pandemic as well as uh, the cyclone Yash and Amphan. So that's why we, we think uh, uh, to use some uh, remote methodologies. Uh, one is definitely photo voice. And uh, the another thing what we used is the digital diaries. Uh, next slide, please. So digital diaries is uh, basically to uh, giving the, the uh, mobile phone, the low cost mobile phone or the uh, the people who have uh, smartphones in both India and Bangladesh, just to capture their daily existence, their daily uh, struggle uh, to live within a dual vulnerability of um, uh, COVID pandemic as well as uh, uh, cyclones. So uh, how this process is, I mean, uh, why we uh, basically wanted to carry forward these activities uh, when the physical contact was not possible, the physically researchers can go and uh, talk to the communities. Yeah. This research <clears throat> process, this digital diaries was a mean to, you know, capture the day-to-day -day experiences with nuances with the communities. So um, as this, this uh, data was collected by the participants itself, means the, by the community members itself, is, it was kind of an empowering uh, experience of those participants because it was less controlled by the researchers like us. 
So this research process in that way go beyond the academic outcomes and it gives, uh, <clears throat> gives the, the community-led processes other than the community-based research. This kind of method is a community-led research which gave us the, the knowledge um, the, of their own lived experiences amidst the climate change and pandemic scenarios. So uh, this and, and as well as, you know, uh, as researchers, we cannot uh, be with the communities uh, or, up, uh, or our res respondents or our participants all the time of a day. So if we need to capture uh, the nuances of their daily life, these tools give us a means of capturing the every moment that the participants want, wanted us to tell or wanted us to capture through our research. So that's how these methods are uh, very helpful. And as I mentioned that this is this was more helpful during the COVID pandemic and uh, cyclonic uh, environment. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so uh, this digital diaries helped us in uh, getting the ground perspectives, what we wanted to capture through our, uh, in, in our tapestry project. And it, it it was quite helpful to uh, navigate our uh, research context. As I mentioned earlier, that various uncertainties, especially during the monsoons, the we were restricted in every year, we were restricted to go to the field uh, and uh, capture the, the practices. So this kind of tool, it helped us to capture the exact moment, the exact uncertainty uh, the people are facing at the, at the time of cyclone Amphan. So that though those those uh, situations was really you know very unfortunate to see, but that realities from their voices, from the community's voices, or from the perspective of the communities, uh, we could capture, and uh, it was very uh, powerful narratives and very on the face. So that is the power of this kind of tools. Uh, we basically used. Uh, this uh, with the migrant families uh, whose uh, specifically whose uh, husbands are migrated to outside and um, this was uh, the women of the of the communities are within these islands <clears throat> so uh, this uh, this also these tools gave us a kind of freedom to you know capture the the continuous changes means uh, during in if in each year in every season uh, we could capture the seasonality uh, of uh, the struggles or the uncertainties uh, through uh, throughout the season of a year and that was that was quite useful because it was not possible for the researchers to go uh, every time because uh, in a, in a time bound manner manner we are doing this research and the complete traditional ethnography is not possible so this method helped us uh, to uh, to engage with various kind of communities and without any hassles, without any, uh, you know, without any kind of hesitations, uh, to talk to the to a unknown uh, persons like the researchers, and easily they can overcome that barriers and uh, continue capturing their uh, life. Next slide, please. So, Mamuda, would, would you like to um, reflect on the case studies? Yes, I can. So yeah. thank you so much, Upashana. So uh, like this picture was taken in April, uh, April this year. So this is the story of uh, Mosammat Fatima Begum, who is uh, almost destitute uh, due to uh, frequent effects of cyclone. She used to live in Chimultuli, uh, but uh, like Shimutuli is an, another village of uh, Shamnagar. So during Cyclone Isla, the like she almost uh, lost their like land, household, like uh, properties and everything uh, due to river erosion, and were forced to move uh, in this place, new place, which is another gram of Munshiganj Union. But what a cruel um, irony of fact! This house also collapsed during Cyclone Amphan. Uh, she is now working as a day laborer, but is not enough, like earning enough uh, money to repair this house. Next slide, please. 
this is a picture of a fresh water pond, uh, which is used to uh, like for uh, cultivating fish and vegetable. Uh, and also the other household uh, activities. The so Suparna Nandi mentioned that they couldn't cultivate at all due to high salinity in the area. And then an NGO uh, dug the pond in which they now hold like successfully uh, like uh, hold uh, rainwater and due to uh, having this fresh water they are now able successfully to cultivate both vegetable and fisheries and also like uh, fulfilling their family demand and uh, selling some of like rest of the products in the uh, market. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this picture uh, was also taken by a woman who uh, mentioned that Cyclone Amphan and Yash had put extra pressure on their livelihood. As a result, all the male members of the house had to migrate seasonally for working purpose. Now the female members are responsible for taking care of their family, for like uh, look after all the household activities, also earning money for day-to-day -day food. Next slide, please. So this is another picture taken from uh, our digital diary work. Uh, the narrative of this picture is uh, from a father's point of view. The, like, I mean, I'm saying uh, the words of a person who took the picture. According to him, uh, these are the cycles that he bought for his uh, sons and daughter. Uh, his daughter is married and uh, his sons had uh, migrated to uh, out of the country. So now, uh, like he mentioned that he had to take loans to buy these cycles, but unfortunately they remain unused for most of the time. Uh, now he's thinking of giving this to someone else who can use them. And he was like uh, becoming so emotional while sharing this story. Like uh, he was saying, we are very poor people. We can't uh, like make money or we can't arrange money for like fulfill our interest so it's not our need it, it was our like hobby like my son and daughter were like uh, demanding it for like moving to school but now they are not able to using both of them so in this way the local people are sharing their daily uh, stories which helps us to conduct the research more actively uh, now, I would like to request Upashana to conclude the presentation. Upashana, hand over yeah. to you. Yeah, can you please move to the next slide? Yeah, so uh, uh, you heard uh, from Mamuda that uh, you know, both in India and Bangladesh sites, the people are uh, presenting their stories, the communities are uh, narrating their like, lived experiences, which, one, which we wanted to capture. But uh, in many great things um, <clears throat> comes with challenges. So, so as the digital diaries um, and say for any uh, visual methods. So ethical concerns uh, is one of the biggest challenge for us. Uh, you know, we tried our best to capture, uh, I mean, keep uh, the anonymity on and uh, any identifiers of the respondents and uh, in which photos uh, the respondents wanted to uh, show their face or because these these are captured by themselves so we we had uh, undergone the process of ethical approvals and um, uh, consent forms so that's how we minimize this kind of uh, risk uh, to the communities and the process is still ongoing and uh, we are we are also evolving this process uh, and how to make it more uh, community led and more ethical so, but at the same time, uh, you know, the bias perspectives, uh, the risk of the bias perspectives is uh, there definitely. Uh, these biases are maybe mainly of two types. One is definitely at the community level because the communities and uh, the respondents uh, specifically, which they wanted to capture, 
uh, that's based on their uh, <clears throat> you know perspectives though we need to capture those but some risk of some biases uh, must be there because we as a researchers are not going to be there to uh see the actual situation we are basically using uh, the community's lens to see which uh which may uh, arise some uh, biases and uh, we uh, we need to strategize how to uh, minimize those biases that process we are still working on bias is definitely there in the process of uh, in the in the perspectives of us from our perspectives also because uh, this, that is that is based on the selection bias because when we started this digital diary process we approached to the community based organizations working with the communities in sundarbans in both india and bangladesh so there uh, maybe there is a there is a very you know thin filter of uh, uh, of the the cvo's bases to whom to give this uh, uh, project or whom to give this cameras or digital uh, phones so this basis and uh, uh, what we we are gathering that uh, you know those those kind of biases are perceived like it is not go, uh, not at all not uh, going to the lowest uh, layer of the societies um, as we expected because this biases would be there and definitely this um, we we are we are strategizing that how to overcome this uh, entire uh, research bias so at the same times remote monitoring and supportive supervisions or problem solving um, from a from a from a distance uh, was very difficult for us and it is still uh, continuing that uh, you know some but some respondents may not uh, be able to use that uh, camera or they have deleted some things how to recover how to um, you know capture it again so this kind of things it's a bit difficult from a distance to maintain uh, but we are still struggling but um, at the at the end i would like to say here that uh, with all my colleagues we we discussed several times about this uh, digital uh, methods and uh, say for instance all the uh, visual uh, methods that it has potentials to capture the community perspectives as nuance as possible at the same times it may get uh, uh, get little bit of biased uh, uh, from the perspectives of uh, the <clears throat> researchers and the communities as well uh, especially on behalf of the community based organizations so maybe a resultant force uh, uh, we will uh, come up or the all the researchers uh, who are doing this visual um, methods uh, it may evolved as a uh, as a kind of uh, participatory ethnography and uh, that will that will be the ultimate uh, of uh, participations of the communities or we can say that now yes now the research, the communities are our core researchers thank you thank you upashana uh, so now i would like to uh, show a video to all of our participants which actually we prepared based on our photo voice digital diary and children voice messages so let's enjoy the video
फटो वस प्रोग्राम करते गए वास्तव मुखी अभिज्ञता हो ग्रामे मेरा साधारण दस सामने कथा बोलार एक सहस वज्ञता छा से जगहटा दस संगे बस एक कथा बलार मतन मनोबल तैरि करते पे सब बड़ो अभिज्ञता हो निजे जेहेतु ग्राम बांगलार मध्य थी कौनगुल द्वारा कि क्षति होते मध्य से ही अभिज्ञता वास्तव में चोखे देखले अतटा निजे मध्य स्वच्छ धारणा छोना से फटो तुले दशर संगे बसार पर से एक छबि द्वारा जे बुझिए देा हो So I hope you all enjoy the short film. So, do you have any question or comments that you would like to share? Actually, we have one from a YouTube live stream. Um, Hyoban uh, is interested to know over what time period the woman engaged in photography, and did you? I find women preferred using a smartphone or digital cameras. I think this question is for Shivaji or Sumaya. Shivaji, would you like to answer? Um, thank you, Bamuda. I've uh, already uh, tried to answer it in the chat, and it has been passed on to Shivaman. Oh. And okay. if my Sumaya wants to add anything to it. Okay, I'm handing over to Sumaya. Uh, so yes, the question has been already addressed. Uh, it was collected through over a period of six months. Uh, we have a plan to, you know, uh, validate all the photographs uh, among the community with a group of women together. Uh, we will share the pictures with them uh, and we will collect their insights, uh, her own insights and the insights of her neighbor as well. And uh, going forward, we have plans of roundtable discussions and uh, various presentations and also an online exhibition with the photographs that uh, these women, uh, they have clicked. Uh, do we have any more questions? Could I ask a question? Could I ask a question? Vinita. 
So yes, uh, just to say that you know we uh, Anandita and I were part of the uh, in collecting the narratives of the children, and in comparison to your photo voice, which is absolutely superb, I was thinking whether we could draw out the comparisons between the the youth seem to be I don't know from Anandita's the paintings that Anandita has collected from the schools in the Indian part of the Sundarbans, and from your photo voice experience of women, whether the voices of the of the youth are less hopeful. I mean, there's a sense of pessimism in, the, in, those, uh, in those narratives and drawings of the school children compared to the, some of the more positive images that come out from the women, would you say? Or would you say they're uniformly? Because I mean, I know that uh, uh, Samia, you talked about hope and, and, and positive images. So I just wondered whether we could draw out the the pessimism uh, of the youth versus the more optimistic nature of the women's images sometimes, or, or am I misreading that? Uh, in fact, <clears throat> I think you pointed it quite correctly. Uh, like now, as uh, you shade a light into it, uh, I think you are uh, partially correct about the fact that, yes, uh, through the photo voice journey, uh, it, I'm say, saying it's still in a kind of pilot phase. Uh, we have seen their problems, but they have uh, been uh, very positive in showing us how they are dealing with it. And they have been very proactive about uh, showing us the solutions they are coming up with. Uh, for example, if I just share a personal experience, when we ask them that, uh, you are dealing with uh, so much living in these active deltas, you know, would you like to move somewhere? I mean, if given an opportunity, would you like to go somewhere and resettle and, you know, make your new community and everything? And they're like, no, we don't want to go. Uh, we are dealing with this. We'll have to deal with this. I mean, this is a part of life. This doesn't mean that we will just leave this space. We belong to the Shundar ones and uh, Shundar one protects us. So we want to be here. So yes, uh, besides all the adversities that they deal with in their everyday lives, at least I think we found positiveness in their approach as well. So uh, it would be very interesting, I would say, to draw a conclusion with a joint narrative from both the visual methods that we have conducted in this tapestry project. So thank you. No, yeah, yeah, thank you. Just one more additional question. I think uh, Shibaji, your direction of that film was absolutely superb and excellent. May I congratulate you? And I just wanted, uh, I had, I wanted to tease out one more question, which is how you get uh, experts to engage uh, with these photographs, um, with, the, with photo voice. Um, we have a similar problem with the paintings, and what Anandita and I are trying to do at the moment is to get the experts to engage with them from the Botanical Survey of India, from NGOs and from policymakers to engage with the children's paintings and the way in which we said to invite them, what does it mean to me? How do I read this beyond climate change as a scientific fact? What am I learning from this artist? And these children are artists, you know, uh, that I didn't know before. Um, and I wouldn't know if, if it hadn't been presented visually. So what? how is that process? Um, how do you visualize that process? And has it been effective for you guys in Photo Voice? because we are just going to start that process in um, with our children's paintings, yeah. Yeah, we had uh, the experience from the uncertainty project, which we are you know, trying to uh, put it to good use and also go a bit beyond uh, having this photo voice to be presented in some cases by the women islanders themselves at the round tables and the policy forums. Mm, so, and then uh, last time they came on to the press club and they were so, you know, uh, easily, you know, in the presence of ministers and bureaucrats, uh, which matters and they were answering questions. And since they have the visuals, like in this case, the children will have the paintings. And so the, it is, will be a better form of interaction uh, from a position of, I would not say power, but it will be a shared space. That can be something that we can look at and also the, global exhibition we are planning if we are really trying to uh, you know uh, communicate that well with the right kind of people so that will be uh, one of the avenues to actually share their ideas and also ask for counter ideas or at least start a dialogue thank you
So do you have any question, comments? If not, then I would like to request Emdad Bhai to talk something about like our, like as uh, you are from Friendship and uh, we know that you are doing a lot of works in the like Shundarban region. So it would be great if you could like share some of your interventions, like what you are doing and how. Please come to, uh, come to the stage. Okay. Truly, when I was uh, watching all the case studies and the film, I was feeling myself I'm there because it's a very, very uh, uh, known stories. And it's great that uh, ICAD and uh, our Indian partner, Public Health Foundation, uh, bringing this in the global platform. Honestly, uh, the powerful thing, what proved the smartphone, the, a photo can tell thousands of stories. And that you made it happen. So it's really brilliant. I, I would love to be continue with this journey. And I, I appreciate the, the big, bold step I get taken for uh, to bringing. And it's not, in other words, you know, to give them confidence, it's not only the storytelling, it's giving them confidence, empowerment that we can, I can. It's not the man's world, it's all our worlds. That, Truly, uh, uh, I, I'm significant contribution for the self-esteem. So for self-esteem, empowerment, confidence, much needed for our people, those who are fighting for climate crisis. And I truly appreciate. Congratulations. So, uh, Sabina, do you want to like say anything? Like, as you are a, a professor of climate change and development, like working a lot of work. So would you like to add? But um, yes, I, I really enjoyed your presentation and it was amazing to, to get an insight into a region I haven't had the possibility to visit. And I liked so much to hear at the end in the film how the women felt empowered to speak up and how the photos really help to do that. I've worked with similar techniques in Mexico, and I think we can just say this is the methodology which works, which gives, gives people a voice and which helps also to bring it into a forum like the COP26, yeah, because not everybody can come, but these pictures were very clear. We now have to find a way to show them to the negotiators as well. Thank you for this great session. Thank you. Thank you so much for a wonderful word. So now it's like, uh, I think it's time to close so we can uh, conclude our session. And thank you. Thank you so much for attending and uh, providing uh, thoughtful words with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. Also, if you could please, uh, uh, Mahmuda, uh, yes, announce yes. tomorrow's session, please. Yes, actually, we have another session tomorrow. So uh, this one was based on uh, like our uh, methodology, like what sorts of method we are using for conducting this research. But tomorrow's session will be more focused on our activities, our intervention, what sorts of like uh, initiative we are taking and uh, what are the findings. So I would like to invite everyone to attend that session. So that one will be held in the same place uh, around like 9 to 10 a.m. So hope you all will be able to attend that one and will enjoy as well. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.